Jared, in trying to understand the human mind, which has uh, been a, a life pursuit, um, the, the, the whole area of language is exceedingly important to define what it is about the human mind that makes it different. How can we begin to understand the concept of language in its broadest sense? Language raises some big questions, perhaps three big questions come into focus for me. And those are the questions why some languages have spread at the expense of other languages, why you and I are now talking English rather than, say, Navajo. The question, what is happening to the world's languages? Why are languages vanishing so fast? And who cares about it? And then surprising recent work on the benefits of being multilingual, work that really appears to me because I spend huge amounts of time on learning my 12 languages. And huh. I've asked myself, would I have done better to spend the time playing chess rather than <laughs> learning Italian and foray? <laughs> okay, so let's let's look at each of, of those. Uh, let's let's start with the last one in terms of the, the benefit to, to the brain uh, of, uh, of exercising our, uh, our neurons with, uh, with language. This is recent work um, particularly by Ellen Bialystok and her colleagues in Canada. And it's work that really appeals to me about the advantages of, of speaking other languages. There's a debate, particularly in the United States, um, is it good or bad to be multilingual? There are Americans who think we would be, be better off just speaking English. But it turns out that one of the big fears of growing older now is Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. There's much discussion about what you can do to protect yourself against Alzheimer's. Should you play bridge? Should you play Sudoku? Mm -hmm. Should you play chess or whatever? But recent work has shown that the best protection against the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease is to be bilingual, maybe multilingual. The rule of thumb is that the, a second language protects you for about five years against the symptoms it's remarkable. of Alzheimer's. It is remarkable. And how, how does that happen? I mean, you have to keep switching in your brain between whole new systems of grammar as well as the words themselves. You and I are now talking English, and I'm, I'm having to suppress. You know, wir sprechen nicht Deutsch, <laughs> non parliamo italiano. So one has to do these back and forth within a few milliseconds mm. at interpreting a sound. Mm. You just, so I just said, I just said, <laughs> I didn't say, ich, ich habe. Ich yeah. Yeah. So I have to do this quick back and forth. That quick back and forth is a constant exercise of the brain. It's like going to the gym and working out in the gym, but working out constantly to de develop muscle. Sure, sure. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I, I want to ask you another question. Uh, that was a <laughs> big <bicycle>. <laughs> <laughs> um, And so, so let, let's go to the, the other two, uh, the, uh, the spread of, of languages and why we're speaking uh, English rather than the, the Native American language or any other language. 500 years ago, people in this spot would have been speaking Gabrieleno or Chumash, but we're yeah. speaking English. Why did it turn out that way? Why is it not the case that in London now they are speaking Gabrieleno? Well, history didn't happen that way. Languages spread at the expense of other languages, and it's not that the English language is prettier or that it's more subtle than is Gabrieleno. Languages are spread by the expansions of people who have advantages, technological and social advantages, over other people. So a big question in linguistics is, what caused the spread of Indo-European languages beginning about 9,000 years ago. They spread over a huge expanse ranging from the west coast of Ireland out to western China where mm -hmm. there was an Indo-European language mm -hmm. called Tocharian. But again, the Indo-European language, Indo languages aren't especially beautiful. Why did they replace Etruscan and Basque mm -hmm. and all the other old languages of Europe? The Indo-European people themselves had an advantage. And so language is really riding along the wave of, 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 of the people themselves as opposed to anything intrinsic about the language? That's exactly it. Languages piggyback on mm -hmm. the people. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the Indo-European languages, the best, best guess we can make is that they piggybacked on the first farmers who invaded Europe from Turkey. Mm -hmm. But if you're a farmer, you can support a thousand people per uh, square mile instead of uh, two people per square uh, mile. And so farmers can wipe out hunter-gatherers. Uh, 
or they can conquer hunter-gatherers and marry the women and kill off the men, yeah. with the result that the farming language replaces the hunter-gatherer uh, language. Uh. Okay, so now we're in a situation, though, where, where, where because of so so social changes, a lot of local languages are dying off, uh, and this is your third category. So what, what is the uh, implications of uh, so much of the richness of human uh, communication becoming extinct? The numbers are that out of the world's roughly 7,000 languages, at the rate languages are disappearing, something like, like 6,800 of those languages will be gone by the end of this century and will be down to 200 languages, naturally English, Mandarin, etc. Mm -hmm. And one could say, so what difference does it make if we lose Guarani and Paraguay or if we lose Basque? Well, each language is a way of thinking, it's a literature. Mm -hmm. You could say, what difference does it make if we lose the English language? We can always translate Shakespeare into Mandarin, but to be or not to be, it works <laughs> in, in, in English. Also, different languages allow you to express different things. I'm sure you find that with Mandarin and English, you feel and you can talk different ways. I find that, that I think and feel different ways, whether I'm speaking German or Indonesian or Italian or English. So losing languages means cultural impoverishment, it means individual impoverishment, and it undermines societies that are tied to their languages. <clears throat> so if you reflect uh, in, in an overall sense about the importance of language in defining what it means to be human and indeed the structure of the human mind, how important is it? There are people who would argue that language is the most important distinction between mm -hmm. us and other animal species. You might say, well, important is that we can make tools or important is that we walk upright or important is that we have have marriage but it's language that permits us to develop atomic bombs and to write Shakespeare and to have complicated thoughts with each other and to d design vehicles that go into outer space language one could argue is the most distinctive human attribute that separates us from other animals mm. One could say that the, the reason that 99% of my genes are the genes of chimpanzees, but I'm here and I'm not in a zoo, mm -hmm. is because I have language and the chimpanzees don't. And is that attributable to those 2% gene differences? Somewhere is within the 1% of genes that differ between us and the chimpanzees. Of those 1% genes, uh, some are the genes that give me little hair and give a chimpanzee a lot of hair, <laughs> and some are genes that make chimpanzees very strong and me weaker. But the ones that, that allow me to put the chimpanzees in the cage are the genes for language, not the genes for having no hair. <laughs> well, I hope those genes also are the ones that basically enable us to develop a culture, because with language then you can have an incremental culture. And so a very small difference, perhaps, in language then gets multiplied enormously. One can say that language is the hinge on which, which cultures fall. So the difference between the French culture and the Italian culture and the English culture, it's related to their languages. <laughs>